And good afternoon. We start with First Minister's questions. Question number one from Ruth Davidson. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Uh, engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Ruth Davidson. I thank the First Minister for her answer. At the weekend, her predecessor was asked on television why one in five children leaves primary school functionally illiterate. And he replied that this was just one statistic. No, it's not. It is thousands of lives. And 10 years on to the day from this SNP government taking charge, and with councils across Scotland being asked to run our schools tomorrow, perhaps it's worth asking the current First Minister about some more statistics. Here's one. Why is it that between 2011 and 2015, the proportion of children performing well in numeracy fell in both P4 and P7? First Minister. Well, I've made absolutely no bones about my determination to raise performance uh, in literacy, in numeracy, in attainment across the board. That's why we have established the new national improvement framework. It's why we have established the new attainment challenge and the attainment fund, uh, which, as we have talked about many times in the past in this chamber, is now channeling additional resources direct to head teachers uh, in order that they can uh, decide the ways in which to best raise attainment. It's also why, and we will see uh, the latest uh, figures uh, that uh, are in the same vein as the ones Ruth Davidson cites uh, shortly. Uh, these are sample surveys. Uh, I'm not dismissing them, but it's one of the reasons why we have taken the decision to start uh, publishing comprehensive school by school, local authority by local authority data so that we know how our schools are performing, uh, but crucially so, how we, so that we know what is working so that we drive up attainment. So we'll continue to remain focused on something that is vitally important for young people and parents right across the country. Ruth Davidson. The First Minister talked about her intention to improve, but absolutely no acknowledgement that the failures are on her watch. So let's take another statistic. In science, the Sutton Trust this year has reported on the pronounced and sustained decline in able pupils' performance under the SNP. Indeed, over the last decade, since the SNP came to power, it says that this decline is equivalent to around an entire year of schooling. Now, I know that the First Minister is going to stand and answer to every question and tell me that everything is about to be sorted soon. But can she tell me, why has this drop in standards happened on her watch? First Minister. I think, while I don't dismiss any of the statistics that Davidson cites, I think she does a disservice also to young people and to teachers across the country. Because as we have... As we have set out before, we now see uh, record numbers of higher and advanced higher passes in our schools. Uh, we also see record numbers of positive destinations, so that is more young people going into employment, further education or training than has ever been the case before. Uh, we are seeing far fewer pupils now uh, from our deprived communities leaving school with no qualifications. Uh, and we're also starting to see, although I want to see this go much further, we're starting to see a narrowing uh, of the gap between the least and most deprived areas in terms of access to university. So it's not simply a case of standing here uh, and saying what my intentions are, although my uh, intentions are absolutely solid in terms of continuing to make uh, improvement. But I can point to, as I have just done, the improvements we've already made. So we'll get on uh, with investing the money, uh, with conducting the reforms, with supporting teachers and head teachers to make sure that we see con continued improvement for young people right across the country. Ruth Davidson. Presiding officer, I stand next to no one in my admiration of the hard work that our teachers do, but what they do is work under guidance that they are given and is described by education experts as, and I'll quote, self-evident lunacy. And that's what's coming out uh, of the government and its arms. And here's what the first, and here's what parents think, is that this SNP government has presided over falling standards, has failed utterly to ensure we have enough teachers in our classroom to turn that situation around. So here is yet another statistic. 4,000 fewer teachers in Scotland schools than there were in 2007. And we know that 16% of training places for English teachers are unfilled and over a quarter of training places for maths are vacant as well. Now, there are possible solutions to this, 
We have councils in some of our rural communities in the North East and the Highlands saying that they want more flexibility to tackle this crisis themselves in a way that suits their circumstances. But they're having to hang around for an answer because John Swinney's promised review of governance has been delayed and delayed again. So it's a problem of the SNP's making, councils saying, let us fix this now, and an education secretary saying, no, let me chew on this some more. So again, I ask, why? Why is this? First Minister. Firstly, in terms of the governance review, uh, that will be published, or the recommendations that we are taking forward from that will be published shortly once we have properly analysed, as it is right and proper to do, all of the submissions that have been made to that. And one thing I think is absolutely certain, if past experience is anything to go by, that as soon as we do set out the direction of travel over the governance review, uh, the other parties in this chamber who have been calling on us to do it for months will suddenly decide that they oppose everything that we are deciding to do. I would absolutely, absolutely lay bets on that. But of course, the governance review, as Ruth Davidson well knows, is one part of a wider package of reform. The National Improvement Framework, the Attainment Challenge, the Attainment Fund, the introduction uh, of standardised assessments, which uh, I remember Labour used to support, but again, as soon as we decided to do it, they decided to oppose the publication of school by school, local authority by local authority figures so that we can track exactly how... Well, see, there we go. The Liberal Democrats oppose those reforms. So what we see in this chamber time and time again are opposition parties calling for things to be done and as soon as they're done, they decide to oppose them. So we will get on and take the action backed by investment that is delivering improvements in our schools and will continue to deliver improvements in our schools. Ruth Davidson. Planning officer, I'm sorry, but jam tomorrow just doesn't cut it. Exactly. Because with this SNP government, it's not just one statistic, it's yeah. or two or three. It is a 10-year record of failure. And it's leaving a situation where, according to the architect of Curriculum for Excellence, our schools can no longer be classed as world-leading. So tomorrow, we elect the councillors whose job will be to support our schools on the ground. And the SNP says education is their top priority. But doesn't their 10 years of failure tell an entirely different story? Yeah. First Minister. Into, we'll go into the local elections tomorrow, pointing to the improvements that are being made in our schools, and crucially, pointing to the £120 million of additional resource that is now in the hands of headteachers to drive further improvement. And I, I'm standing here wondering why it is the case that if education was of any priority to the Conservatives, they're putting out around the country right now uh, leaflets. I got this one through my door. This leaflet mentions me or the SNP or independence a grand total of 43 times. It mentions, it mentions Ruth Davidson or the Tories just nine times. One of those is her signature. It mentions her policies on education zero times. Because in this election, the Tories haven't put forward a single policy on our schools, on social care, uh, on roads, on transport, on anything. They have a constitutional obsession. So I will get on with raising standards in our schools. Thank you. Question, question number two, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the week. First Minister. Uh, I have uh, even more engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Kezia Dugdale. Thank you. In 2015, the First Minister said she supported a 50p top rate of tax for those earning more than £150,000 a year. In 2016, she changed her mind and said she didn't support it when she had the power to deliver it. Now, in 2017, without any sense of irony, the First Minister claims to support it again. Does she really expect people to believe her this time around? First Minister. Well, Kezia Dugdale should maybe listen a bit carefully. In 2015, I said I supported that across the UK. In 2016, I said that if we only did it in Scotland without the powers, which we don't have, 
to tackle tax avoidance because they lie at Westminster, then the advice we had taken uh, was that that could potentially lose revenue. And I don't think that anybody in this chamber seriously would stand up and argue that we should put up a tax if the advice says that it would actually lead to a reduction in the revenue. So we're going into a UK-wide election in a few weeks' time and we'll publish our manifesto in due course. But of course, of course, this is Kezia Dugdale, uh, the leader of the Labour Party that just a few weeks ago published a local government manifesto saying that the council tax freeze had crippled local government and yet is leading eight Labour-led authorities into this election promising to freeze the council tax. So perhaps Kezia Dugdale would comment on that before coming here and asking me about the issue of taxation. Kezia Dugdale. For the First Minister who spent 10 years and two elections promising to scrap the council tax. <laughs> and I've just heard the First Minister say we shouldn't bother trying to tax the rich because they'll just find a way around it. The same That's argument the Tories argument. have been making week in, week out for years. And the truth is, the SNP have voted against a 50p top rate of tax in this chamber no less than eight times. So much for Stronger for Scotland. And there is a pattern developing here. Nicola Sturgeon has spent her entire career campaigning for more powers to stop cuts to public services. But now she has the power to do so, she refuses to use it. We have the ridiculous situation where a nationalist First Minister says she wants to tax the rich, but only if England does it first. Isn't it the case that Nicola Sturgeon has plenty of principles when she's campaigning, but nothing but a list of excuses when she's in power? Because what I actually said, the, the problem was that we don't have the powers in this parliament to stop the wealthiest uh, potentially trying to avoid a higher rate of tax. I want these powers. Kezia Dugdale argues to keep these powers in the hands of a Tory government at Westminster. That is the difference between me and Kezia Dugdale. And you know, Kezia Dugdale can't really expect to be taken seriously on the issue of tax because she has come here week after week saying that I should raise taxes not just on the rich but in ordinary working people as well. Uh, she has come here week after week saying the council tax freeze is wrong and yet we go into an election tomorrow with eight local authorities across this country promising to continue to freeze the council tax and each and every one of those councils is a Labour-led Council, how can Kezia Dugdale have a single shred of credibility on tax? I think voters tomorrow will make their own judgment on Labour right across this country. Kezia Dugdale. The council tax is unfair and regressive. How do we know that? Because the SNP have been telling us that for 10 years. And there we had it. Just another excuse as to why she won't ask the richest people in society to pay a bit more tax. What a shame it's the same one the Tories have been using for years. And she claims to back a 50p tax rate, but she won't implement one here in Scotland where she has the power to do so. She claims to be protecting the NHS, but local services across the country face cuts and closure on her watch. And she claims that education is her number one priority, but spends every waking minute plotting how to force another independence referendum. <laughs> does, Nicola Sturgeon, does Nicola Sturgeon feel any guilt, any guilt at all? touring the country, warning against austerity, when it's her government that have cut £1.5 billion from council services. First Minister. Look, I'll continue to do what I have done for the past few years, which is to argue against austerity at source. That's what I'll be campaigning for in this election. Uh, the difference between me and Kezia Dugdale is she doesn't want to scrap austerity. She wants to transfer the burden of austerity onto the shoulders of low-paid people right across this country. And why is that? Because she prefers to allow a Tory government at Westminster to take the big decisions about our economy rather than have them 
made here. But, you know, Kezia Dugdale is wrong in what she says about the NHS and about council services. The NHS budget is more than £3 billion higher today than it was when this government took office. The number of NHS staff is 10% higher almost than it was when we took office. We've got the best performing accident and emergency departments anywhere in the UK. We've got £120 million going into the hands of head teachers. But I come back to the central question. If Kezia Dugdale, albeit wrongly, is accusing this government of shortchanging local authorities, then the question remains this one. Why is it only Labour councils going into this election promising to freeze the council tax? Why are they not doing what SNP councils are doing, choosing to raise revenue for schools and for social care? Kezia Dugdale has no credibility in this issue, and I think from looking at her, she knows it. There's one constituency supplementary from Jackie Bailey. Can the First Minister offer any hope to my constituents having to endure very lengthy orthopaedic waiting lists in contrast to what she's just said about the NHS? And let me give her an example. Mr Howie was told he was to have a knee operation at the Golden Jubilee only for funding to be withdrawn by NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. He is virtually unable to walk and is in constant pain. So can I ask the First Minister why, at the start of the financial year, when patients are in severe pain and their waiting time has been badly breached, why are Greater Glasgow and Clyde rationing treatment and denying people the opportunity to have operations at another NHS hospital, the Golden Jubilee? And what action will the First Minister take to ensure that Mr Howie and many others like him get the treatment he needs and deserves and we put patient care first? Our NHS boards right across the country are investing to make sure we've got uh, short waiting times and waiting times today are much shorter than they were when this government took office. Uh, health boards are also focusing on making sure those waiting longest uh, get priority in terms of treatment. I uh, would uh, say that what Jackie Bailey has outlined uh, certainly is something I want to know the detail of. I don't have all the details of the patient case. The health secretary has told me, however, that she has spoken uh, this morning, I think, to the chief executive of Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board about this particular case, and it is being looked into. So once we have the detail of that, I will ask Shona Robison uh, to write to the member uh, with the, the full details details of the case and I hope that would be welcomed. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. To ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Uh, Tuesday. Patrick Harvey. The uh, First Minister accuses opposition parties of demanding changes on education uh, and then complaining when the Scottish Government implements those changes. The Greens have never argued that standardised testing uh, or reviews of governance structure are the root of the problem. And the Greens have never supported the stripping of local authorities of their power to make decisions about these matters. What we have consistently argued is that resources are at the core of the question. And if we want to recognise the thousands of teachers that have been lost in Scotland, the hundreds of additional support needs teachers, school librarians, classroom assistants, and the lack of resources that are available to our local authorities, isn't it very clear that that has to be the core of the solution if that's what's been causing the problem? Greens forcing the Scottish Government to reverse £160 million of cuts to local councils was an important and essential first start. But isn't it clear that it has to be the beginning? It has to be the beginning of a change which puts resources back into our local authorities so that they are able to support the people, the professionals, doing the job around the country. First Minister. Well, Patrick Harvey and I have uh, something of a disagreement when it comes to education reform. I certainly uh, concede that that is the case. I do think it's important not that we strip local authorities of their responsibilities. That is not uh, our intention, but that we do give greater uh, flexibility and autonomy and control to local schools because much of the ed evidence around how you drive improvements uh, in education say that uh, that along with the capacity uh, of teachers and the quality of learning and the involvement of parents is how uh, you do that so that's why we're taking forward those reforms I also think it is vitally important that we have more rigor around uh, both how performance is assessed uh, of pupils but also how that is reported publicly that's why we are introducing standardized assessments not to replace teacher judgment but to inform teacher judgment so that there is more rigor uh, around that and then uh, we want to make sure 
that the, there is transparency around the performance of schools. So for the first time ever, uh, we are uh, going down a road where we are publishing uh, not sample surveys based on a couple of pupils per school, but comprehensive school by school data so that we can properly assess how we're performing. Um, and I think these are the right uh, reforms. Um, and, you know, I will continue uh, to carry on with them because I believe they're essential to improving uh, the attainment in our schools, which everybody across the chamber says they want to see happen. However, where I do have uh, an agreement with Patrick Harvey is on the issue of resources. Uh, we have always said that resource in the hands of head teachers is a vital part of our attainment drive. That's why, as I've said on a couple of occasions already today, uh, the £120 million that is going direct to head teachers is a crucial part of that. Head teachers are then free to decide how that money is invested and if they want to invest that in additional staff, uh, additional support for uh, learning staff, then that is up to head teachers. And of course, that £120 million uh, pounds fund is part of the wider attainment fund, uh, which totals £750 million pounds across this parliament. So yes, resources and investment is crucial, but I believe we need to couple that with the reforms that will allow us to drive improvements faster. And I make absolutely zero apology for that. Patrick Harvey. Well, I'm afraid I still don't believe that the Scottish Government has yet countered the concern that standardised testing, whatever its motivation, will end up being used for the same purposes as league tables if they were called that. But I also don't accept that teachers want to be managers or that head teachers want to be chief executives or chief financial officers of their schools. I think they want to focus on what they are passionate about and what they're talented at, which is teaching and education and the life chances of young people. But if we want to reverse that decline, 4,000 teachers lost, if we want to reverse the decline in these other important professions, additional support needs, librarians and classroom assistants, the overall level of resource needs to go higher. Over the successive years, we need to be resourcing local councils to make those decisions. The Scottish Government is willing to cap council tax rates at national level without legislation. They're willing to tell England and Wales what their income tax rates should be, but not willing to change them in Scotland more than an inch. Isn't it very clear that we need to reject this Tory notion of Scotland as a higher tax part of the UK, make sure that people like the First Minister and myself pay a bit more tax into the pot to produce the resources that will go into education, that will make a difference in the life chances of every child in this country? First Minister. Well, because of decisions we've taken, of course, higher rate taxpayers, which account for you know, the top 10% of income earners in Scotland, are paying a bit more than uh, higher rate taxpayers elsewhere in the UK. These are the right balanced tax decisions uh, that I think it is appropriate to take. I don't think at a time when inflation is rising uh, and living standards are under a lot of pressure, I don't think it is right to increase income tax for uh, those on the basic rate. And again, people are, are, are willing, uh, free to take a different view, but that is my view. On the issue of education and local government funding more generally, uh, in the financial year that we are now in, there is available to local services additional spending power of £400 million. As Patrick Harvey rightly said, some of that down to the discussions uh, that his party and my party had leading up to the agreement of the budget. So there is more resource in local government supporting local services and specifically in education there is more resources going direct to head teachers. Now let me uh, assure Patrick Harvey we have no intention of seeing head teachers become bureaucrats. The point here is allowing head teachers to be the leaders of learning that they need to be in order to drive improvement and to put in their hands the resources that they need in order to do that. So these are sensible reforms, I think, that will lead to improvements in our school. Uh, I think it is right that we have vigorous and rigorous debate around these things, but I am determined that we will take forward these reforms and I'm determined uh, that we will be held to account on them, which is why the, the publication... You now, other people uh, like to dismiss that as leak tables. That is the information that parents have access to to know how the local school is performing. It is information that the public, including other members in this chamber, then have access to to hold me and this government accountable. It's absolutely right and proper that we have it and we'll continue to make sure that it is available. We have some supplementaries. The first from Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. 
Last night on STV, Ruth Davidson repeated the fiction that under the new two-child limit for tax credits, a woman only has to write their name and tick a box to prove that they've had a subsequent child as a result of rape. Is this true? First Minister. Uh, no, it's not true, and Ruth Davidson knows uh, it's not true. I, I, you know, we, we had a, a very powerful and, and at times very emotional and emotive debate on uh, the two-child tax credit cap and the rape clause just a couple of weeks ago. And I actually find it quite hard to believe that Ruth Davidson could have sat through that debate, as she did, and listened to some of the testimony, particularly the letter from a constituent that was read out by Kezia Dugdale, and still go on television last night and say that it was just a bit ticking a box. Um, I think that's disgraceful. And I think, more importantly, what it demonstrates, um, or at least what it gives the impression of, and I, I will choose my words carefully, what it gives the impression of, uh, because I hope this is not the reality, is a complete lack of empathy for the emotional trauma that any woman in these circumstances would have to go through of having to declare to a third party that their child had been conceived as a result of rape. A woman that probably is determined to do everything in her power to protect her child from ever uh, being aware of those facts. So I think it is really important that whatever disagreements we have around policies like this, and I, it, it beggars belief for me that anybody can defend the rape clause. It does fall into that category of a policy that is indefensible, in my view, and I think that's why the Tories are struggling so badly to defend it. But whatever our disagreements, for goodness sake, when it comes to support for often the most vulnerable people in our society, a bit of empathy, a bit of compassion, and a bit less of the dismissive, it's just ticking a box, I think would uh, go down well from the Tories. Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The BBC have reported a response through Freedom of Information from Police Scotland, which shows that the number of serious assaults, murders and robberies are increasing in Scotland. What's the First Minister's response? First Minister. Well, firstly, the information that the BBC is reporting today is, is management information, and it's important to stress that because it is not official figures. It may turn out that the official figures reflect the information that's been reported today, but it is important that we uh, point out the fact that often, or, or sometimes, that can not be the case. But I, I guess the more substantive point is this, is that while figures fluctuate, what we are seeing in Scotland, and I've been seeing for quite uh, some time, is a, a long-term uh, reduction, a uh, trend reduction in non-sexual violent crime. And we see that, um, and we have seen that uh, for some time. There's been a 52% reduction in non-sexual violent crime uh, from 2006-07 uh, to 2015-16. Um, in 2015-16, which is the latest year statistics are available for, the number of homicide victims in Scotland was at its lowest level since comparable records began in 1976. Uh, so, of course, we always have to make sure we're supporting our police uh, to keep crime, all forms of crime, low. But we are seeing uh, a long-term reduction in violent crime, uh, and we've got to make sure that we continue to do everything possible uh, to ensure that that continues. That's one of the reasons why, over the past number of years, we have supported the police to have additional officers at a time when 20,000 police officers have been lost south of the border, and why we will continue to support our police to do the excellent job that they do right across the country. Pauline McNeill. Does the First Minister support the 10,000 people, and probably more, who signed a petition against the imposition of a £2 drop-off fee at Glasgow Airport. Does the First Minister agree that, in fact, it won't, re won't reduce congestion and that, given that there are not great public transport links to Glasgow Airport, a rail link might have made the difference, but the reality is that families going on holidays that they're entitled to will be forced to pay it will not reduce congestion one bit because, in fact, it's a smaller area and they're going to lock drivers in and force it to pay. Will the First Minister condemn this? This is a money-making venture. That's what it is. It's got nothing to do with congestion. And will the First Minister genuinely... I mean, I'm raising this quite genuinely, First Minister. There is public fury at this, and I think that the public would appreciate at least your understanding that they don't think this is justified. First Minister. Well, 
I, I, of course, understand the concern uh, of members of the public whenever a change like this happens. I absolutely understand that many of my constituents, uh, in common with MSPs across the chamber, will use Glasgow Airport and use Glasgow Airport regularly. My constituency is one of the uh, closest geographically to Glasgow Airport, um, so I understand that many people uh, will have <laughs> concerns. This is a matter for Glasgow Airport, and I think it is incumbent on them to make the case for why this is necessary uh, and to have that case able to be uh, scrutinised. Uh, Polly McNeill also raised the issue of uh, an air link and obviously in uh, not, not the last parliament or even the, uh, certainly the one before that we had uh, debates about uh, the Glasgow Airport rail link and for very good reasons we decided not to proceed with that at the time. But what Polly McNeill should also be aware is through the uh, Glasgow and Clyde Valley City deal, which is being funded uh, jointly by the UK and the Scottish governments, uh, these councils now have the ability, if they so choose, uh, to have access projects uh, to Glasgow Airport. So uh, I certainly uh, will. Let, let's wait and see who's in charge of these councils after tomorrow. Uh, but whoever's in charge of these councils after tomorrow have the wherewithal to prioritise access to Glasgow Airport if that's what they choose to do. And Mike Rumbles. Does the First Minister not understand that her plans for the publication of school league tables can result in teachers teaching to the tests rather than concentrating on teaching our children in the round and that this may have the opposite effect to that which she intends? First Minister. I say this in all sincerity, if Mike Rumbles understood properly what it was we were intending to publish, he wouldn't have asked that question because he would know the very premise of his question is wrong because it's not the test scores that are being published, it's the performance of young people the performance of young people against the required levels of curriculum for excellence judged by teachers informed by the test. Now, why is that important? Because it makes the teacher judgment more rigorous, but secondly, it avoids the narrowing of the teaching to the test because it's not only the standardised test score that's taken into account. A teacher will also look at homework and the performance of children in school. So can I say, again, in, in all sincerity to people across this chamber, let's have these debates, but come to these debates informed with the facts of what we're doing, rather than your own prejudice about what we're doing. And then perhaps we will have meaningful debates in this chamber uh, on this very important issue. Question number four, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to Scotland's population rising to an all-time high of 5.4 million. First Minister. Well, we welcome the news that Scotland's population is growing uh, because we know that stimulating population growth is a key driver of sustainable economic growth. Uh, the figures published by the National Records of Scotland last week also underline the key role that migration has to play in our work to grow the population. Uh, there is robust evidence that confirms our long-standing view that migrants from outside the UK positively contribute to our society. They are mostly young, they are mostly economically active and highly qualified. So Scotland benefits significantly from the contribution made by people from across the world who've chosen to live, work and study here, bringing new skills and expertise and helping to underpin future economic growth. And we should take every opportunity to tell them that they are very welcome here. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the First Minister for that answer. In the half century before the millennium, more than two million Scots emigrated, and in the 20th century, Scotland had the lowest rate of population growth of any nation on earth. Such was the much vaunted union dividend, which left us with an economy swiftly overtaken by so many others. Does the First Minister agree that while Scotland's population is slowly increasing, the number of excess deaths over births is of concern, despite the best efforts of the presiding officer? And a hard Brexit that stops the free movement of people will not only end Scotland's population growth, but lead to real skill shortages and damage our economy. First Minister. I feel as if I should start by thanking the presiding officer for his contribution, uh, but I better not. Uh, I think the, the latest estimates that were published uh, show that our population increase is driven uh, by migration, and that's why, uh, and I make this point very seriously, continued inward migration, and I know this can be controversial and unpopular in places, but continued inward migration is critical to maintaining our population growth, which in turn is critical to driving economic growth. Um, if current trends continue 
net inward migration is projected to be the main contributor to our population growth over the next 25 years. That's why of all the things that I think should concern all of us about Brexit and uh, the outcome of the Brexit negotiations, uh, any serious restrictions to the ability of EU nationals to come and live in Scotland uh, would be deeply damaging to our economy. So it's important that all of us across this chamber, uh, I think, and all of us in uh, mainstream politics have the courage to make that argument because if we allow uh, the immigration and migration debate to be uh, distorted, then we will damage our economy and our society as a result. And these latest statistics, I think, are a stark reminder of that fact. Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you. Scotland has consistently attracted fewer migrants to come and live here relative to other parts of the United Kingdom in relation to our population share. Why does the First Minister think after 10 years of SNP government, Scotland is a relatively unattractive place for immigrants to come? First Minister. What a disgraceful thing. What an utterly disgraceful thing for a member of this parliament. in this chamber and describe his own country as an unattractive place to live. Murdo Fraser, hang your head in shame. As I've said before in this chamber, I remember the days and they are becoming dark, distant days when Murdo Fraser used to be a serious politician. Yeah. Now it seems he just aspires to be a figure of fun in this chamber. But the serious point here is this, we do have to encourage people to come here. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, more migrants will settle in London and the South East is partly down to geography, which I think anybody applying a bit of common sense would show. But we've just uh, had figures showing the contribution that inward migration is making to our population growth. So the real question is not the one that Murdo Fraser posed. The real question is this, are we going to make sure over these next few years that we continue to have the ability to attract people to come to live in Scotland? Or are we going to allow narrow-minded Tories to put barriers in the way of that? That is the big question and the big decision for Scotland in the next few years. Question number five, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the First Minister whether head teachers will require the agreement of the relevant local authority before a decision is made about how the pupil equity fund will be spent in their schools? First Minister. Well, I've been absolutely clear, uh, and the Deputy First Minister has been equally clear that the pupil equity funding scheme, the £120 million of that, will be used at the discretion of head teachers. Uh, the National Operational Guidance on the Use of the Funding sets out clear principles to support head teachers in their decision making. Uh, head teachers should work in partnership with each other uh, and their local authority to share good practice, pool their knowledge, uh, and uh, consider the use of funding. But it is the discretion of head teachers that will be the central factor in deciding how that money is spent. Liz Smith. Uh, could I thank the First Minister for that reply? And uh, she's quite correct to say that John Swinney stated categorically on the 13th of September 2016 that under the Scottish Government reforms there would be a presumption of decision making at school level. Could I ask her why it is then that from Scottish Government documents it is very clear that there will be both national guidance and local author authority guidance compelling head teachers to agree the use of the pupil, to, pupil equity funding and the local authority to be accountable to the local authority for how that money is deployed. Could the First Minister tell Parliament whether head teachers will ever have real autonomy or is this just spin? First Minister. This money is to be used at the discretion of head teachers and I think Liz Smith is, is misrepresenting, I'm sure not intentionally, the, the, the guidance and the purpose of the guidance. I mean, let me uh, just point to uh, some of the, the, the content of the guidance, uh, which uh, I know the Commission of School Reform had claimed, I think wrongly claimed, uh, was highly prescriptive. Uh, the directions in that guidance refer to the key principles which set out that the activities uh, funded by the Pupil Equity Fund uh, firstly must be additional mm -hmm. to current spend. Who can possibly disagree with that? Secondly, that it must be targeted at closing the attainment gap. Who could possibly disagree with that. That's what the money is for. Thirdly, that it should be based on the evidence of what works. Again, that seems to me to be fairly sensible uh, guidance. Uh, and next, that parents, children and young people should be involved in planning 
for the use of pupil equity funding. Again, I think that's common sense because, as I said in response to Patrick Harvey, there is evidence that the involvement of parents and young people uh, in the initiatives to drive improvement are, are key. So, of course, head teachers will share best practice with each other. Of course, uh, as with any use of public money, there will be an accountability, not least through the figures uh, that are published about the performance uh, of schools. Uh, of course, there will be accountability, but this money is money to be spent at the discretion of head teachers. So, you know, having called for this, uh, I would have thought that members across the chamber who have called for it would now support it and get behind it. Question number six, Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government has taken to improve access to sanitary products. First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government is actively considering what support we can provide for women and girls on a low income to have access to sanitary products in a, a dignified way. Our Fairer Scotland Action Plan sets out our commitment to tackling poverty. Uh, however, we know that in the face of Tory welfare cuts and continued austerity that are pushing more and more people into poverty, it, it does seem that we do this with one hand tied behind our back. Uh, but whether it's the bedroom tax, the Fair Food Fund, the Scottish Welfare Fund or the Independent Living Fund, to name just a few of the Scottish Government's policies, uh, we or mitigation of the bedroom tax, I should say, is a Scottish Government policy. Uh, we spend hundreds of millions of pounds every year protecting the poorest and most vulnerable in our society from the worst excesses of a Tory government. Uh, of course, these are resources we would rather be investing in further anti-poverty measures, not in mitigating or putting a sticking plaster on Tory cuts. Monica Lennon. I thank the First Minister for her answer. I welcome some of the steps that the government has outlined, because last year when I asked the question, um, I was told that the government hadn't done any work to assess the issue and that women could use food banks, but I feel we have moved on from then. Last year we had our first debate in the Scottish Parliament on period poverty, and since then I've announced my intention to bring forward a Members' Bill on this issue. There has been an outpouring of interest and support for addressing this gendered inequality here in Scotland. The STUC just last week, the NUS, the Scottish Youth Parliament, the EIS and Gender, the Trussell Trust, I could go on, they all support the proposal. No woman or girl in 2017 should have to face the indignity of not having access to sanitary products during menstruation. There is simply no excuse for why this should be a case in a progressive and wealthy country like Scotland. So does the First Minister agree with me that sanitary products are a necessity, not a luxury, and that the Scottish Parliament should, accordingly, be taking all necessary action to enshrine that right of access into law? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I, can I commend Monica Lennon for taking forward this issue? It is a, an important issue. Um, I look forward to seeing uh, the contents of our private members' bill, and the government certainly is uh, open to working in partnership as we explore the ways in which we can deal with this issue. I do agree with her, and, and I think any woman, I hope a lot of men, but certainly any woman would agree that sanitary products are not a luxury, they are a necessity, and we should not have a situation uh, where uh, women are forced into situations of indignity uh, because they are on incomes that can't support uh, the purchase of these products. So as uh, Monica Lennon has acknowledged, uh, the, the Scottish Government, led by Angela Constance, is exploring a number of ways in which uh, we can help uh, with the issue of period poverty. And I know Angela Constance uh, would be happy to uh, talk further with Monica Lennon <coughs> as uh, our consideration of these issues develops. I hope this Parliament can uh, come to uh, a consensus and agreement about uh, ways in which we can in a meaningful way help here and the Scottish Government is certainly keen to do that and it would make uh, I think a welcome change to be talking about we help, how we help women uh, in vulnerable positions rather than debating the ways in which certain others and certain other places are trying to penalise women in vulnerable positions. Mark, sorry, question number seven, Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister how the High Court of Justice decision to order the UK Government to publish its act uh, pollution strategy impacts on Scotland. First Minister. Uh, the decision relates to the timing of the strategy's publication rather than the content of the strategy uh, and I understand that the UK Government has now decided uh, not to appeal uh, the High Court decision and will consult on the updated action plan. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to promoting uh, air quality. The UK action plan will include a contribution from the Scottish Government setting out how we intend to deliver further air quality improvements in Scotland through the actions that we set out in our own air quality strategy, Cleaner Air for Scotland, uh, the road to a healthier future, and also uh, by establishing Scotland's first low emission zone. Mark Roscoe. 
Can I thank the First Minister for that response? But, Presiding Officer, I'm not prepared to put my family at risk anymore on Scotland's polluted streets. This is a public health crisis. 2,000 people die every year, not just in the First Minister's city, but across Scotland from Perth to Aberdeen. The UK government's plans were slated by the High Court. They rely on dodgy emissions data from car companies while putting off action to save lives today. The Scottish government has made the same errors and is captured by the same ruling. When will the First Minister step out of the shadow of these toxic Tory plans and urgently review Scotland's clean air strategy, including funding more than just a solitary low emission zone? First Minister. Well, obviously I'm not responsible for the UK government's plans. I am uh, responsible for the plans the Scottish government puts forward. And, you know, on this as on any other issue, we are happy to uh, discuss with other parties in the chamber how we uh, improve the plans that we have in place. But I think it's important to point out that we in Scotland, we are meeting both domestic and European air quality targets across, across much of the country, although uh, there are still hotspots of poorer air quality in a number of areas, particularly urban areas. And it's an issue uh, that interests me hugely, not just as First Minister, but as an MSC, MSP representing an urban constituency. Uh, all local authorities with air quality management areas now have action plans in place and the Scottish Government is working with these authorities including with Glasgow City Council to help implement the plans and deliver air quality improvements. Uh, another point that is I think important to, to, to stress is that we have set actually more stringent air quality targets than the rest of the UK has. Uh, Scotland is the first country in Europe to legislate for particulate matter 2.5, a pollutant that is of special concern uh, for human health in particular and we're providing practical and financial support to local authorities. Uh, so we will continue to take actions to address what I absolutely agree with the member is an issue of the utmost importance and uh, the Environment Secretary I know would be happy to speak to the member uh, if he wishes to uh, in order to take his views about how we strengthen these plans further. Kate Forbes. Thank you. Could the First Minister provide further details on the work underway to deliver Scotland's first low emission zone? First Minister. Well, we're working uh, with local authorities and uh, indeed with other partners to develop the first low emission zone, uh, which will improve health and help create uh, better places to live, uh, to work and, and for people to visit. Uh, SEPA have already developed the national modelling framework uh, that provides the evidence base in designing the zone uh, and informs the specific vehicle restrictions needed to deliver air quality improvements. Uh, the designation of low emission zones is, of course, a matter for individual local authorities, but we look forward to agreeing with local authorities the location of the first zone uh, once the new local administrations are in place following tomorrow's election. Thank you very much. That concludes the first oh, point of order. On a point oh, of order, sorry. presiding officer, yesterday the Scottish Government issued a press release announcing a regeneration project in Glasgow, which everyone knows is an SNP target. I have written to the Permanent Secretary of the Scottish Government to complain against the clear possibility that PERDA guidance was ignored. Can you advise if there are any grounds to bring the Minister in question before this Parliament next week to explain how on earth a government announcement with the clear possibility of influencing party politics was allowed to go out. Can I thank Mr Thompson for the point of order. I think these, these sort of questions are matters for the ministerial code and should be pursued with the Scottish Government directly. That concludes First Minister's questions. We'll move on to general questions.